In the last week, we have unfortunately witnessed an increased number of imported cases among individuals crossing into the country through our borders. And these new areas have become a matter of grave concern to us. Among the positive cases that have been registered in the country this last week, a total of 43 cases have recently crossed the border from neighboring Somalia and Tanzania. Lakini kama unajua kuna mambo mengine ya ajabu. Unakuta dereva labda anazuiliwa hivi kwenda wapi. Wewe atoke Dar es Salaam mpaka huko ametembea kilomita 1000 na kitu. Hajaanguka mle kwenye gara na liendesha vizuri. So therefore fellow Kenyans in accordance with the advice by the National Emergency Response Committee on Coronavirus and our National Security Council, I am today directing as follows. That all drivers of cargo vehicles shall be subjected to mandatory COVID-19 disease testing and will only be granted entry into the territory of the Republic of Kenya if they test negative. Pimo. Zaidi ya wasafiri wanaotokea Kenya, wa Kenya, zaidi ya 19 wana corona. Sasa hatuwezi kusisi turuhusu waendelee kutoka Kenya na corona zao waingize ndani ya nchi yetu. Nipigie simu na mheshimiwa Kinyata, rais wa Kenya. Alinipigia nikiwa bado chato, akinipa pole. Na akawa amenielezea mambo haya ya corona corona kidogo. Na leo nimezungumza naye pia akaniuliza na mimi tumekubaliana naye Hello I'm Joaquin Boshe welcome to Utafiti Hub This video focuses on the role of diplomacy in dispute settlement and conflict resolution drawing scenarios from the disputes that we have witnessed so far during this COVID-19 pandemic period It captures a live panel discussion that was held on 23rd May 2020 where we were joined by two distinguished panelists, Professor Maria Nzomo of Kenya and Ambassador Barry Four of Seychelles, who I shall introduce in more detail shortly. For the very first time, we, and due to public demand, it was an open conference with live guests. The guests were limited, they were a limited thematic group of um, practitioners as well as undergraduate and postgraduate students of, um, at the University of Nairobi in the area of alternative dispute resolution and East African community integration. Given the many requests that we received before and after this particular session and the positive feedback that we have received from um, the session that we had, we are considering the possibility of scheduling another live panel discussion um, very soon. So keep checking on our social media pages, um, whose details we have provided below for an update on this uh, particular upcoming session that we may be hosting. Uh, this session that uh, we will be having today was recorded and if you are watching it now, well, it means uh, that the recording has been successfully uploaded on the Utafiti Hub YouTube channel. We invite you to look at the other videos on this channel that we hope you will also find useful. The background of this particular conversation is that the world is often described as a global village. The eased global mobility and flexibility of interaction has, of course, also increased the number and altered the nature and dynamics of disputes. The recent COVID-19 pandemic um, has exposed and emphasized this evolving fragility of relationships at all levels. Domestically, we have seen within family, within com parties to commercial transactions, as well as at the national context. We have also seen the same playing out internationally at uh, various uh, levels of contract and engagement. The objectives, therefore, of this particular session is one, are one, to give context to the role of various actors and interests in alternative dispute resolution. Um, again, with the, that particular background of the cases that we uh, have been emerging. For instance, we have seen between USA and China, the issue of um, the origin of COVID-19 pandemic, 
the resulting management and liability question, as well as the issue of uh, sourcing of, of uh, material and um, you know the masks and all that. Then we've also seen a dispute or a teeth uh, between Kenya and Tanzania on the COVID-19 border testing. And uh, you know this each one of these scenarios has come um, has um, come with various um, ramifications. For instance, the issue of free movement of persons and goods. And we've also seen calls during the same period, we've seen calls for interventions by many countries, diaspora populations, um, asking to be taken back home, uh, in particular the, the case uh, with respect to allegations of xenophobia in China. Um, now, the, the other role, the other objective is to examine, therefore, the role of diplomacy in disputes generally and in the times of crisis, as um, we have seen and really to enable the stakeholders to interrogate the role of, of generally this uh, ADR, alternative dispute resolution landscape um, uh, in conflict resolution and disputes, particular focus on diplomacy, and particularly in times of crisis, uh, such as we have already highlighted, taking into account, of course, for instance, the requirement under the UN Charter on you know, the, the obligation upon states to settle their disputes um, amicably, and what is the effect of this in the grand scheme of things. So also to consider the way forward. One, also in terms of uh, in line with appreciation of, um, is it necessary for us to take to factor in historical perspectives? What is the possible way forward? What are the kind of lessons that we are learning from uh, these scenarios that we are looking at? The panelists respond to our questions and also questions from the participants. And you will see this uh, from the discussion as uh, it rolls out. Without further ado, let's introduce the panelists. We have, Professor Marianne Zomo. She is a prominent scholar and professor of international relations and governance. She currently serves as the director of Institute of Diplomacy and, and Studies at the University of Nairobi. She has contributed immensely to the development of the study of diplomacy, both Kenya, regionally and globally. Professor Marianne Zomo holds the distinction, ladies, listen to this, uh, of being the first Kenyan woman to attain a PhD in political science. Between October 2003 and 2009, January 2009, Professor Nzomo held a number of ambassadorial posts in Southern Africa. Um, she was in Lesotho, Mozambique, Swaziland, what we now call the Kingdom of Eswatini, and Zimbabwe. And also, she has served as the Kenyan ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland for many years. Uh, Professor Nzomo was also awarded the second class of the Elder of Burning Spear by the president of Kenya. We also have Ambassador Bai Four from Seychelles. Ambassador Four has been serving as the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since January 2013. Now, since February 2019 to date, he is Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and the Blue Economy. Before this, Ambassador Four had served in Brussels from 2006 to 2009 as resident ambassador. He had also served, or he has also served as the Secretary of State in the President's Office since June 2010. Ambassador Four has also served as Principal Secretary for Foreign Affairs between November 2009 to June 2010, when he was responsible for restructuring the ministry and implementing the President's policy of active economic diplomacy. Ambassador Four has held a number of ambassadorial posts, serving as Seychelles Ambassador to the European Communities, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Spain, Portugal, and Andorra. He has led various regional and global partnership agreements, as you will hear him share in the course um, of, the, of his discussion. Ambassador has also previously served as the Director of um, Investment and Trade Promotion at the Ministry of Industry. He has served as Director for Local Government, uh, its local and international business and Director General of Economic Planning from 2002 to 2006. Ambassador Four was elected in 1993, re-elected in 1998, and again in 2002 
as a member of the National Assembly, representing one of the districts in Seychelles. Uh, while, and while in the National Assembly, Ambassador Ford was the chairman of the International Affairs Committee between 1996 to 2006. He was also a founding member of the African Caribbean Pacific, the ACP Parliamentary Assembly in 2005. We thank so much both Professor Maria Nzomo and Ambassador Barry Ford for taking time to share with us. So let's get started. Diplomacy um, is, can be defined very simply. It's about negotiation. Life is about negotiation. We are negotiating space. We are negotiating issues that are of interest to all of us, but on which uh, perhaps you can't have everything. So there has to be a place in which you make a compromise. We negotiate at, at the local level, at the family level, at the national level, at regional levels, and of course at the global level. The higher up you go, the tougher it gets. And depending on the nature of the issue, sometimes even negotiations do fail. Uh, despite all the various legal and institutional mechanisms that have been put in place by the United Nations to guide us in this regard. And so diplomacy is a very good instrument when it is well used because it is one of the ways that we avert crisis, one of the ways we manage conflicts when they do occur. It's one of the ways that development comes about when people can talk and agree that in order for one to develop, all must develop. And so, therefore, uh, the role of diplomacy in international relations and in international engagements, especially in the 21st century uh, period where globalization is not giving us a choice in terms of whether you want to coexist with the rest of the people in this world, uh, becomes of very crucial importance. If I can utilize uh, the little time I have here to address uh, the current situation between uh, Kenya and one of its, our neighboring states, uh, Tanzania, uh, because it's an issue that has baffled uh, quite a number of people, uh, even ordinary citizens, because we all understood that Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda especially, are not just neighbors, but they share a lot, they share a common history, and they need each other for matters of, of, you know, of development. They need each other for matters of security. They need each other for a whole lot of things. And especially now when we are battling with a disease, a global disease that no, none of us has an answer to, cooperation among states and non-state actors is crucial because no one can resolve this problem on their own. And so what is obviously happening at our borders is of concern, not just to the governments, but also to the citizens because they are directly affected. And I'm sure you have seen all those, you know, trucks piled up at the border, uh, you know, people very looking very frustrated. It has not been funny at all. And I think the question all citizens are asking is, why can't these heads of states and government talk to each other? This is a small problem which they can resolve. You know, talking to each other require a certain amount of modesty and everybody giving space to the other. That, you know, you don't feel like you're going to be a small person just because you are the one who has requested the meeting. And it also requires that the meeting be not confrontational, that you are the one who is wrong and I'm right. But to find a space on which, you know, the issue in question can be negotiated and dealt with. Because it's very unfortunate at a time where our entire focus should be on dealing and managing this global disease, we are spending, you know, a whole lot of time on, you know, issues that are just diverting us our attention. It may be useful to know that this is not the first time Kenya and Tanzania have had these kinds of disagreements. Uh, we have a long history. You'll be you'll be surprised. Dating back 1960, at a time when the two presidents at that time actually three, uh, you know, Nyerere uh, of Tanzania, Uhuru, of, uh, uh, Uhuru's father, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, and uh, 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 Obote of, of Uganda had, had agreed, in fact, led by, by uh, um, uh, President of Tanzania, Nyerere, that when they all become independent, they will join together. In fact, Nyerere delayed independence of Tanzania to wait for Kenya and and, uh, and uh, you know, it's the other neighbor 
to be ready to be you know also independent and we form a community obviously politics came into the mix and this did not happen and the rest as people say is history we have had disagreement after disagreement after disagreement and on one you know maybe tempted to call a sibling rivalry but sometimes it goes beyond being sibling rivalries and so this is a continuation of a pattern we have seen before and even scholars are sometimes amazed at the level of realization that this is doing nobody any good and it is it is uh, you know uh, comforting to know at least in the last few days they have started to talk to each other but i think we need to put to a stop this kind of uh, behavior you remember two years ago there was also the issue of the chicken and the cows that had crossed over into tanzania and it became another you know diplomatic row and that's why i'm saying some of these things just really are side sidelining the key issues that we should all be focused upon but diplomacy is something that we all have to learn because it is needed here it is needed globally even about negotiating this global disease uh, instead of you know passing blame on one another and and in action or so and so etc but right now it is a list of the commodities we have on the table unfortunately uh you know the, this kind of acrimony does not encourage us but those of us in this field especially those who are scholars we continue to encourage government that please there is no other better way to go if you have a disagreement on an issue negotiate let you know find that space of cooperation rather than you know this uh constant uh disagreements that are taking us uh nowhere in the classrooms of course we have no problem my students you know uh, they cheer me when they hear me say you know diplomacy diplomacy but i wish our policymakers would equally not just you know talk but also walk the talk because that has been lacking we say a lot of nice words and then within a fortnight or less we have changed our minds on the same or forgotten what we said before so this in a in a sense links that but you know, we can also go beyond East Africa, if I may say this in terms of closing, so that we don't look like the bad guys in a world of good people. Even other countries around the world, they are just thinking about themselves. There is this, I think, emerging very primitive nationalism around the world, where cooperation in a globalizing world, which should be an obvious thing, is the one thing you don't see too often. It is about you know, blame game is about inaction, it's about hormonal things. What China did to Africa in terms of, you know, the, that the xenophobic behavior was totally unnecessary. It doesn't encourage good relations between, uh, you know, China and, and African countries uh, when you treat other citizens so badly. I'm not aware that there have been any meaningful uh, way that this, uh, you know, area has been settled, but it's a concern that you find things like that happening in the midst of a global uh, health crisis as the one we're having now. The crisis itself of health calls upon what we call healthy diplomacy. There has to be diplomatic engagement of a health kind. It was already there, by the way, at the United Nations, matters of health diplomacy have always been on the table when i was ambassador at the united nations in geneva we spent many hours at the world trade organization negotiating and dealing with matters uh health uh because although health should not be a negotiated commodity it becomes a commodity when certain manufacturers global manufacturers you know owning the pharmaceutical industry put a price on their drugs and even deny people medicine when they need it, unless the price is right. So it becomes a commodity to be negotiated, uh, unfortunately. Um, and, and therefore, even agreeing on a ways that we, everybody can gain and nobody loses and a win-win situation, not just between pharmaceuticals and government, but among member states themselves, that becomes also a diplomatic area where uh, negotiations are, are required. I, I would fully agree that uh, diplomacy um, plays an instrumental role in conflict uh, resolutions. And uh, the uh, action that the two presidents uh, have uh, uh, performed uh, recently uh, in this uh, phone 
conversation, which was initiated by the president of Kenya, uh, highlights uh, how uh, diplomacy was put to good use and how it quite quickly um, diffused the situation. And from what I have gathered from the ground, because we have also representative, representatives in both countries with which we have, as you said, excellent relations with Kenya and with Tanzania, and both of our representatives, the honorary consuls, have confirmed that the tension no longer exists. So that is a, 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 an exemplary uh, way that these two statesmen uh, conducted themselves. I also had the opportunity of listening to the speech delivered by uh, the president of Tanzania a couple of days ago, uh, where which was uh, you uh, uh, you helped uh, me uh, uh, by providing me with the translation uh, of that speech, which was in Kiswahili. I do understand some Kiswahili, uh, but uh, not to that uh, extent. I spent. Uh, just a few years uh, in Uganda, uh, from when I was 18 months to nine years. Uh, so I've uh, lost quite a bit of, of my knowledge of, of, of Kiswahili. So, but uh, that translation of his speech uh, was clear, uh, clearly uh, highlighted that uh, there is a spirit of uh, understanding between the two leaders uh, and uh, the president uh, was taking the opportunity in speaking to that community on the border uh, with Kenya, uh, that there is hope for the future and that soon uh, the, the, the problem would be resolved, that they had both agreed that the ministers of transport uh, would be meeting soon uh, with uh, representatives from foreign affairs of both countries and the community leaders for them to uh, <clears throat> find uh, the modalities which would um, resolve the, the problem. So th that is a, an ex excellent example of how diplomacy can be put to good use. Now, Seychelles is very fortunate that it doesn't have the luxury of uh, uh, having uh, countries immediately on its on its border. We have uh, we are surrounded by by water, uh, as you know. Uh, Kenya is uh, one of our closest neighbor, but there is. Uh, quite a bit of, uh, of water that separates us. Um, but I would like to mention uh, uh, the example of how we have um, maintained maintain good borderly relations uh, with one country, uh, I would mention Mauritius. You must have heard that uh, there is this uh, extended continental shelf uh, where we have, with the agreement of the United Nations, uh, formed the first ever joint management area uh, between the two countries. Uh, had we not entered into this agreement in 2012, uh, believe me, it would have still been before the United Nations uh, Committee, which deals with the uh, limits of the continental shelf, for us to make a claim to, to this area. Now, we, have, we are now jointly managing uh, an area which is as big as Germany, uh, and we have two treaties that we've signed, uh, one which declares that area uh, as a jointly managed continental shelf, and the other one which establishes the, the legal framework, uh, the institutional framework, uh, and the other laws which are required uh, for the proper management uh, of this area. So it has a, a council of ministers, it's got a, a, a group of commissioners I think that I am a member of this uh, joint uh, management area uh, at the commission level, uh, but I've stopped since about two years ago. Um, and it also has, it will form a, a designated authority. There will be a designated authority, like a government um, department, which would be running uh, that, that area. So um, this is, uh, uh, perhaps just an experience of how uh, borderly relations could be, uh, could be managed. But yes, uh, I think I've said enough. Diplomacy has a, a very important role and diplomacy was at play as well in the formation of this joint management area between Mauritius and Seychelles, the first ever in the world, by the way. 
I have also been looking at the chat and it will allow me, uh, let me just respond to some of the ones that I'm seeing here, which have uh, implications for uh, what, some of what I was talking about, especially in relation to Kenya and its neighbors. Um, this question about the importance of understanding the historical context applies, you know, almost precisely to, to you know, the this back and forth between the, the, the three states because it's not just Tanzania and, and Kenya, mind you. Kenya has have had a, stand, you know, a standing disagreement with Uganda on the small rock called Migingo. Uh, they have never agreed on that issue even to this date. There is still something going on there which is uh, is not very very healthy for, for neighbors. But coming back to the historical context, why is it important? Uh, what I said by taking you back to history of Kenya and Tanzania is crucial because we need to understand that this is not a, a historical, I mean, it's not a, an issue that has come because of this, you know, um, can I say outcomes of COVID invading the region where we have to deal with the, you know, people being assessed at the border, whether they have for, you know, COVID-19 or not. It is a long-standing issue where Kenya and Tanzania have had this sibling rivalry. They just need something to, to trigger them off. I can only call it sibling rivalry because they are going nowhere. They are siblings. And if you look at that history, you'll see a time when Nyerere and Kenyatta were actually disagreeing on a matter of development. And they started insulting each other. Kenya was calling Tanzania a, a, a man eat nothing society. Tanzania was calling Kenya a man eat man society. That in some other very unspeakable terms. These are heads of states and government. And just who has taken what mode of development becomes an issue. We we actually abandoned an, an in East African community that could have really taken us even way beyond. The European Union, because of these uh, idiosyncratic differences between the heads of states, we actually ruined that partnership, which had been initiated in 1967, and it went on for a decade, and it fell apart. Again, of the inability of the heads of states and government to sit down and iron out small differences, which could have been done diplomatically. So history becomes important because it informs the present that what we are seeing presently is not just an occurrence because of COVID and that it will go away once COVID is out of the way. Until we agree that we are neighbors and we continue to be neighbors and we are going nowhere, we are going to continue to have this back and forth. And leaders, you have to reach that point that they agree that it is mutually beneficial for everybody to give something in order to get something. And hence sit on the you know, negotiating table and discuss out whatever the differences are for the larger cause of East Africa on issues of development, on issues of peace and security, and in, on issues of uh, human rights. So that is in, uh, in answering that which was, uh, had been raised by Yvonne. Um, and then there is a, another one here, uh, you know, about power inequalities in, in negotiation. This world was never meant to be equal in terms of the power of state, and it will never be equal. But everyone, big and small, need something from one another. And so, you know, even little, uh, 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 what is it, Lesotho or Gambia, they are important on the world stage. They cannot just be ignored. They have something to give to the world. And they, they, they are part of the world. And it can also be cause a threat to the rest of the world if their problems are not addressed. And so whether you are big or small, you, everybody negotiates at the global stage. Right now, COVID has taught us that doesn't matter how big you are or how small you are, it has leveled the ground of the most vital uh, thing we all need, and that is survival. It has made meaningless the issues about who has how many cars, who wants their food, this and the other. And I think, you know, the bigness and smallness of states is not the issue to deal with in matters of diplomacy. It is true that those who are stronger have a greater bargaining power. They do. 
but also they are also aware they need the others in order for their own survival to be assured. So either way, uh, big and small state, you continue to need one another. And is there a reason why a, a lower power would go to war with a higher power, for instance, to push themselves on a negotiating table, etc.? U.S. is a good example. They moved to Middle East, destroyed Iraq, and one can say, for what? Because Iraq is a smaller power. It's because they had an interest which is larger than Iraq in that region. And in Iraq itself, there is one thing they needed, the oil. And that's why in all that disaster, the only building that was left standing is the oil building, in case some people don't know. Everything else was raised to the ground. And so don't underrate uh, the, you know, the reasons that make states you know, interact, even if it means going to war. Because some people are saying that it was a senseless war. It wasn't for the US, but for the rest of us, it seemed like the US should have looked for someone they are of equal might to fight with. Um, often, and I think that's a very good uh, question, the so-called third party has a side in that if it's a bilateral issue between two states. And especially for you know, global uh, companies, there is always a side for which they are looking for support. And that side is where they are hosted, where they, 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 are, they are domiciled. As you know, most multinational corporations, they, they have their home states. For example, the US will defend any day the interests of its own multinational corporations. They are independent in every other sense, but they are domiciled in that country and they bring wealth to the US. So there is a partnership between the two. So even in negotiations, global negotiations, like at the World Trade Organization, if you watch carefully, the U.S. in its negotiation strategy is having the interests of the multinational corporations in mind, especially agribusiness, those who are involved in, the, in, in agriculture. It has to protect their interests. And that's why you find so many times anything to do with the environment issues of that you know are coming out of climate change and global warming if they affect the interests of the multinational corporations based in the u.s the u.s will not oblige to the demands of other states at the wto almost without doubt because th th those are their farmers and also as u.s it is interest to curtail global trade which competes with their own products so they will do anything. They would rather overproduce than underproduce so that you have no chance in hell of ever selling maize outside Kenya because US, you say we have more than you, we need and we can sell some to you. So that third parties are not necessarily independent parties. They are, they are aligned to a site in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in those kinds of uh, negotiations. And if there is any issue that is killing the negotiations at the WTO, it is that, that the third parties who actually don't sit on the floor of the WTO actually have a lot of influence on what is going on and what is being negotiated. And it obviously ensures that the win-win kind of situation either takes too long or doesn't happen at all. As you know, the WTO negotiations have been going on for more than 20 years now. They were only supposed to have taken three years and it is part of that, you know, can I say standoff or stalemate in, you know, in the negotiations and diplomacy that should have come into, in, in, into this kind of interactions. Indeed, it's, it is important to, uh, to factor into, um, the, uh, into the discussions, uh, both the, the historical context and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, the, circum the circumstances, current circumstances, uh, which are playing as the, uh, uh, the, the discussions to resolve, to address the dispute is taking place. Uh, the, um, but having said that, uh, I would like to, coming back to the issue before us, the historical context uh, of the relationship between the two countries, it is interesting to see how um, both leaders uh, seem to be investing in building trust uh, between between the two. The uh, the example of the COP is is a very, is a very good 
uh, case in point. Um, the example of, I understand uh, President Magufuli, Magufuli sent two peacocks uh, as a gift to President Ken, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta uh, recently. So that is uh, how we need to be using diplomacy for us to invest in building this trust uh, between two countries. So when this trust is established between the leadership, then it will definitely create uh, this, the ecosystem for the, the, the neighbors, uh, the people on the ground, the, the, peop uh, uh, the, two, the, the two nations uh, to have a, a rapprochement and a greater uh, understanding and more people to people uh, contact. Um, the, uh, you also put this question of, uh, is it possible for a weaker party to go into war in order to, um, to get to the negotiating table? Um, if I'm mistaken, you did put this, this question to me, Professor. Um, yes, uh, th we've seen that in international relations. A very good case in point is uh, the relationship between North Korea and, and USA. Um, we see how North Korea, which is the weaker party, how it uses its uh, nuclear weapons uh, in order to, to bring uh, the, uh, the superpower uh, to, to the table for uh, of, of discussions. Um, <clears throat> but is it the best, is it the best uh, uh, approach? Uh, that, is, uh, that is questionable. That is why um, we, uh, we believe that when diplomacy is used um, properly and when both sides use diplomacy properly, I think this is where Professor uh, Nzomo started in, in the beginning of her presentation. Then you see both sides going to the, to the table as equal partners. So they may be having different sizes or different weights in the global uh, political system, but when they show mutual respect for each other, when they uh, use uh, rules-based, the rules-based diplomacy, they use, um, uh, they give primacy to, to international law, they recognize the sovereignty and equality of states. That is when uh, we actually create space and create uh, opportunity for um, a, a resolution of any conflict uh, to actually uh, happen. So this is, <clears throat> this is why um, we, I would like to, 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 uh, to highlight the need for all states, irrespective of size, that we um, respect rules, respect the rules of, uh, of diplomacy, we respect uh, the rules governing uh, international organizations. Um, and uh, when we do this, then we show respect for our neighbors. Um, we also need to, in, uh, in neighbor relations, we also need to look at how our neighbors can prosper, not only how we can prosper. It is important that we provide the opportunity for our neighbor to prosper because when our neighbor prospers, we also gain from it the opportunities for development to happen, uh, uh, in, uh, gain more, uh, more space. Uh, so that's another principle. So the principle of um, prosper thy neighbor, uh, which creates the, uh, the basis for opportunities for development. So we, we can compete, yes, but if the competition takes place within the framework of cooperation, as you uh, pointed out uh, in one of your uh, in remarks, I think uh, we actually uh, provide uh, the occasion for a win-win, for win-win outcomes, right? So, uh, I would um, perhaps like to uh, highlight the need for uh, proper institutions uh, which are agreed 
between uh, neighbors sharing common borders to manage anything, uh, not just to set, not to set them up when we have an issue, but we have permanent uh, institutions <coughs> which jointly manage the uh, border relations. So uh, this would actually provide uh, the, uh, the neighbors the opportunity to preempt uh, issues that may arise. And when issues do arise, that no unilateral actions are taken, but whenever measures are taken, they take place within the framework of uh, proper dialogue. I'd like uh, to uh, share the example of Madagascar. When I was uh, the ambassador of Seychelles in Brussels, I happened to uh, be leading the, uh, the ACP group when the question of um, the, um, uh, the political dialogue on Madagascar uh, was brought to the table of the uh, ACP and the European Commission. Um, so we had uh, the president of uh, Madagascar, current, the current president, um, and that was in 2009. <clears throat> and of course, they had the dispute be between, between uh, him and his uh, uh, predecessor. So between uh, uh, André uh, Ange Rajoel uh, and uh, Marc Rabelman. So he was actually sitting on my, on my left. Uh, and um, since I was leading the, the ACP side. And uh, of course, across uh, the room on the other side, we had the, the lineup of all the EU um, uh, uh, ministers and, and, and representatives. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, uh, the EU assessment uh, of, uh, uh, of the situation in Madagascar uh, was not uh, was not helpful at all. So there was during a pause in the discussions. I actually had a conversation uh, with the with the president, and I told him then in 2009 that uh, in the interest of Madagascar, uh, what uh, was best is that uh, he. Um, actually um, uh, withdraws from from the future uh, the prospective elections elections that were that were, that were going to uh, take place um, of course um, that was a, di a very difficult decision that he had to make because when you are um, the head of state leading a movement uh, your supporters uh, and members expect you uh, to go um, right to the end of the race. Um, and so it was not easy. That was in 2009. We all know what happened. Uh, in, it was, I think, in 2012 that both the uh, leaders, uh, Marc Gravelman and Henri Rajouel, decided to step back from from the process, uh, remain as, go back as, as observers and allow different uh, candidates to stand in the elections. So that's when we saw peace happen. There was, of course, a lot of um, negotiations that took place, uh, but they actually lost time, you see, between 2009 and 2012. So, uh, or a little bit later, now we are in 2020, the elections took place last year in 2012. In 19 and previous to that, there have been five years uh, of uh, pres President uh, uh, Air. Uh, so uh, that takes you to 2014, uh, really. So, yes, in 2012. So they actually lost three years, uh, you see. So, what I'm saying is that you, you can lose a lot of time, uh, a lot of resources, and you can push your country backwards. Um, you see, uh, if the um, 
the the right decisions are not taken uh, at the the right moment uh, let me put it this way national interest among states will always be there and those national interests will always compete and so without doubt unless we don't want to engage in suicidal activities some level of diplomacy for self-interest for self-survival you have to come in in it doesn't matter how powerful you are us now his second competitor in terms of power is china clearly but those two know that you know there is just so much acrimony that they can have at some stage they will need to agree on something like now they go, the ongoing trade war between them they know the limits they know the limits of that trade war and behind the scenes and i'm sure ambassador would agree with me on that they'll have to engage in a lot of behind the scenes diplomacy which you normally don't see verbalized to ensure that they don't keep on the other side because being powerful means that they can destroy themselves and destroy the whole world and i'm saying this with the confidence because since the formation of the united nations in 1945 when all the countries present swore that they would do everything possible to ensure the world does not go again into war it also meant that they know the limit to which they can push themselves arguing and where diplomacy has to bring some sanity to avoid all of us getting killed and that's why we have survived for seven decades without war, a global war. So I have hope that there is future for diplomacy. The second reason is that the world of the 21st century is globalizing and linking all of us, whether we like it or not. And by it linking us, the way it is, it means that we have to negotiate a lot of things that we didn't need to negotiate before we have to negotiate resources these resources globally are dwindling and so if all of us have to have something those resources need to be negotiated and we have to know the limit of trying to take what does not belong to you now the other you know reason that i i believe this is is necessary there are certain developments such as diseases that we have no control over and they bind all of us they are tragic in nature if they are not addressed jointly not by one country this crisis of corona should have taught us that this is a global disease it never gave us a warning that i'm on the way so prepare yourself we have been linked by that disease whether we like it or not and therefore because of that a lot of negotiations will be needed before the final this is is over of course states are you know started by looking at their own countries and going you know looking inwards in, into themselves how well they can do with dealing with a crisis but we are seeing more and more there are discussions going on because vaccines have to be found and they have to be shared and the future after you know uh, corona has also to be looked at because everybody is threatened by a future where you know, resources for survival, global survival are so limited. Issues which were already there before, like climate change, we could become even more uh, compounded by uh, the development that we are likely to see. So either way, I see a lot of hope for diplomacy because I don't think any country in its right mind want a global war. And that's why you have seen most of the wars being fought. They are what we normally call intrastate wars, not interstate. Because everyone realizes just how dangerous you know, having a third world war can mean. It will maybe literally mean wiping all of us off. Now, then uh, there was another question put to me, and that was regarding the Kenya-Somalia maritime uh, border dispute. It's a very interesting one. And a lot of you know people have been asking why couldn't you just resolve it instead of taking it all the way to the international court of justice and the united nations which those of us who know how the icj works a decision that will be made there will be binding on both kenya and somalia and we cannot both win it's 
it's not a win-win. This is a case where once you take it to the UN, to the ICJ, the decision made by the ICJ is binding and is final. There is no court of appeal. And so even as we did this, I already the state concerned are regretting because they know this, not, not both of them will win. However, going to the ICJ was also a statement of the fact that they didn't want to go to each other, war with each other. And therefore they preferred a methodology which still falls within the framework of diplomacy. And that is, you know, going to the ICJ where they can now wait for the outcome as they deal with this situation. However, as you know, as the ICJ is making a decision on that, Kenya and Somalia, as you can see, they are trying to find uh, ways of mending their fences because they will need each other. They will always need each other. And they, you, know, they, you know, whatever happens. And so they may need to agree on the strategic maritime resources over which they are, they are you know, they are, which has driven them to this level of dispute. Because it's not a piece of the ocean they are fighting about. They are fighting about the strategic resources, including oil and other commodities that are very deep in the maritimes. And so either way, I, I can see this eventually being uh, resolved Already it is being resolved uh, diplomatically by involving the ICJ, but even much better when Kenya and Somalia agree with, uh, uh, to, to engage uh, in, a, in a truce which will bring to an end a crisis that was you know, absolutely unnecessary in the, in the, in, in the first instance. Um, I, I, can't, I can't see the, the, the point here. There was something else being asked of me here. Uh, Chinese treatment of Kenyans in China, that was very unfortunate. That kind of xenophobic behavior is totally unacceptable. It is misplaced and it complicates an already complicated situation. Xenophobia is primitive. And you know, especially when it is so crudely applied, even you know, someone who has never gone to school would see something is very wrong with a disease that started in Wuhan and suddenly it becomes an African disease. That's the most ridiculous thing. And I think China, you have to apologize to Africa in my, in my view. Not in that lame dark way that they did. They owe Africa an apology as part of di di good diplomacy. You have to find a way to negotiate the good relations that were there before, which have now been destroyed by this uh, xenophobic uh, behavior by China. I think uh, the president of Madagascar uh, himself has said that he has not uh, found a medicine uh, to cure uh, the, the the COVID-19 uh, 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 disease. What he has said uh, is that uh, they have a, an improved traditional remedy, so which is it's quite different uh, from uh, a medicine or a vaccine that, that, that cures uh, or that could cure. Um, when, you, uh, when, when you claim that you have a, found a medication, then of course it has to go through the, uh, the tests um, that the WHO uh, requires. Uh, but we have learned as well uh, that um, there were some um, inappropriate remarks that were attributed to the president of Madagascar, uh, where it has been said, for instance, that he has asked uh, African countries to withdraw themselves from ourselves, from all international bodies which have been created by the, the Western world. Uh, he has, uh, uh, his administration uh, has categorically denied that he ever made uh, such a statement. So to put things into context, um, there are traditional remedies that um, a lot of uh, countries worldwide, especially in Africa, have for different kind of kinds of, of di diseases, uh, which uh, have not necessarily gone through um, clinical tests as, as such. Uh, they have all um, uh, operated, if you wish, um, outside the context of the, 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 the standards that the World Health Organization 
um, has uh, established. But that which doesn't mean, however, that these remedies have not been effective. Uh, we know uh, how effective they have been. And the president of Madagascar um, uh, has uh, claims that he has one, uh, which, which works. I think it should be seen within that context. Um, and it's important, as I said, for us to properly um, contextualize uh, things. Earlier on, you said, um, when you go into negotiations, what is uh, the, um, the, the effect of the noise, the background noise? What effect does the background noise have on the, the negotiations? They do have um, an effect. And those people who are at the, the main actors in the negotiations need to be aware of this, but they also need to have an objective, um, put up an objective perspective to this background noise. So they need to have in their team people who are able to go through this background noise and to uh, discern what is fake and what is genuine and, and do not give importance to what is fake. Um, address what is genuine, what which will actually contribute to, um, to the analysis and to bringing uh, a resolution a helpful resolution to to the uh, to the dispute so it's very important uh, that we we look at it very uh, carefully you see so um the, for instance this um, what was going around on on, on, on social media uh, with respect to this so-called um, call that the president of Malaga had made to all african states to withdraw immediately and that it uh, it was taking the lead in, in, in withdrawing immediately from international organization. This was totally unfounded uh, and, you know, proper. In your team, you need, to be, you need to have people in the negotiating team. You need to have people who look at this uh, carefully, who go through uh, all the so-called background noise and, as I said, establish what is true, what is not true, and um, go into the negotiations with an open mind, with an objective mind, um, and um, try to give space uh, and uh, opportunity for the, uh, uh, the conflict to be resolved um, on the basis of uh, a win-win outcome. Thank you. Um, there is one that has come back to this question of Somali-Kenya dispute. And uh, uh, the participant is asking, that, you know, to, actually trying to confirm from me whether there were some efforts which were made you know uh, to resolve this issue before it was taken to the international court of justice certainly yes as you know the international court of justice is called the, the court of last resort member states only go to the icj after the local mechanisms for negotiations have failed they have reached that point where they are unable to resolve the, the problem themselves and so they, because they don't want to go to war, which is the next alternative, they then choose the methodology of going to the ICJ reluctantly, because for what I said before, that only one can win the case. They can't both win. And once the case has been decided upon, both states have to comply. The loser of the case and the winner. Now, and it can get very complicated when the, the outcome comes, because again, in this case, it's good because Kenya and Somalia are almost a week away. But you can imagine if it was Kenya against the US, there would be a huge com complication because of the role of the Security Council and the, and the veto power. But that's another issue. So yes, there was negotiations, but they had failed. And you know, the, the uh, Mohammed is asking what really went wrong with the, the process of negotiation. I cannot tell you, I wasn't private to that discussion, but something did go wrong, meaning they reached that stage, they were not seeing right why. And remember also that this issue of Kenya and Somalia maritime dispute does not only just involve the two. There were other external parties who also have an interest in that area, maritime affairs. So they also are influencing this diplomatic engagement. And so at the end, you know, the, you know, the two made, you know, at least Somalia, because in Somalia, remember, we took Kenya to the ICJ. Kenya actually just had to go along.
because Somalia was already there. And, and so this process of uh, uh, confrontation uh, must be resolved at some stage. And uh, you know, the worry now is that once the ICG has made a decision, the, the decision is binding. Uh, and so looking forward, I think this is a time for the two countries to start mending fences because they always be neighbors. They have to live with one another and they have to find, you know, a, you know, a look forward beyond the ICJ, how they are going to continue to exist as two, as, as two states. Uh, you've been a wonderful uh, chair and moderator. Uh, that's, that's where I start from. Uh, and secondly, uh, the audience, they have put a lot of questions to us, some of which are uh, uh, we don't have the time to to, to answer. Uh, so the, the audience has been uh, amazing. Uh, and I've been very happy to have on board the uh, Professor Nzomo. I am uh, impressed with the depth uh, and extent of, of her knowledge and how objective and uh, uh, I would say candid she has been uh, with, uh, with her interventions and her various uh, remarks. Um, before I, I wrap up, there, are, there were a few questions that put to uh, me directly. One was on Madagascar. I did not say that they do not have a cure. Uh, they, uh, I did not say that they, 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 that they do not have a medicine. What the president of Madagascar understands uh, is that uh, they have uh, a, an improved traditional medicine, or in French, un remède traditionnel amélioré. Um, which uh, should be taken in the, into, into the traditional uh, way of things. Uh, but um, interestingly, the WHO now uh, has decided to start doing the clinical tests on the, uh, what Madagascar uh, has, uh, is putting forward. Uh, can, can Seychelles um, play a role as a strategic mediator in conflict uh, resolutions? The fact that we are uh, non-aligned uh, country. Um, yes, I, I think uh, Seychelles uh, is, um, is positioned uh, um, to, to be able to, to contribute in that manner. So if, uh, yes, if Seychelles uh, is requested, is asked uh, to mediate in, in any way, uh, then we would consider that uh, uh, favorably. Uh, of course. Um, what uh, long-term impact um, will uh, COVID-19 have on um, the SADC uh, countries, considering that all these countries are, are interconnected? Uh, that was another question that was put. And I, I think, uh, yes, there will be a long-term uh, impact um, on uh, not only on SADC, but also on COMESA and on the region in general. In fact, uh, the, there will be a long-term impact on the whole globe itself. And what is uh, required from us really is to, to carefully look at it. Um, don't waste time. Uh, let us organize ourselves to assess what this impact is. Um, uh, give it a little bit of foresight as well. Look far into the future uh, and uh, um, really put our thinking caps on. And government should not be do the, doing this alone. Uh, government should be bringing on board um, the private sector, the professionals, the engineers, all the um, stakeholders, relevant stakeholders in society, uh, include people as much as possible. Inclusivity is very important. Uh, and get uh, the brains working to see how uh, we could tackle uh, in the best way um, the, um, this, what I call the, the economic uh, um, uh, disaster that uh, that is impending um, and uh, of course we will have to re-engineer what we're doing today this virtual meeting is a very good example of um, of what uh, what what we are doing um, of how we should be approaching um, the the issues which are before us look i've i've, I've noted that at one point there were 153 uh, participants uh, taking place uh, taking part in this uh, in this conference um, next, to, in, in a couple of weeks, and in fact, on the 3rd of June, I understand the president of Kenya is calling a, uh, uh, the first virtual meeting uh, of um, heads of state. It's going to be an extraordinary uh, summit of the heads of state of the state, sorry, of the ACP, 
which normally meets um, in Brussels uh, or in an ACP capital. The last one, as you know, was in, took place in, I believe in December in Nairobi. Um, uh, the, uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a virtual meeting. Um, and um, had he called a, 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 in normal times an extraordinary meeting of, 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 of heads of state um, for the 3rd of June, I'm sure he would have had um, minimum participation of, of heads of state. Now that it's going to be a virtual meeting, uh, there will be, uh, I am sure, a very good turnout uh, or representation of heads of state and, and government. Now, these are opportunities um, as, because so the pandemic will also bring not only uh, a disastrous situation, but uh, limitless opportunities. And we need to be uh, to, to be, to be uh, considering this and uh, seeing how we can uh, nurture all these opportunities so that um, our countries do not only suffer, but we also see the possibility for us to actually move forward with, uh, with innovation, uh, with uh, uh, creativity, and uh, diplomacy will definitely um, have a great role uh, to play uh, in the whole uh, equation, which should not be ignored at all. Now, in this situation that we find ourselves uh, with this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, where our diplomacy has been used in order to, um, to get uh, uh, international support and assistance to our countries, to get the medication that is required, to get all the years that we require in order to fight the pandemic, We've also used our diplomacy uh, for us to repatriate as far as possible uh, our citizens who have been stranded worldwide. Um, you see, diplomacy uh, has been used, uh, and even in the case of this border uh, conflict between Kenya and Tanzania, and there was the other one between Tanzania and, and Zambia, which, which ended uh, smoothly as well, diplomacy uh, was, was used. So, um, this is where I would like to conclude with my final remarks. Um, let us use, put uh, diplomacy to, to good use. Um, uh, let us uh, put in place as well um, regional institutions to manage border relations um, uh, and be proactive in doing it uh, and not only put them in place in order uh, to resolve issues that may arise from time to time. So um, strong regional border uh, relations uh, institutions are called for, called for sorry. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me also start by thanking very much the organizers for not only inviting me, but also bringing uh, so many uh, Kenyans together um you know from their voices and contribution i can tell this is a the younger group uh not th those of us who are aging and they, they are really this is their world uh you know it, it, and i keep telling my students don't look over your shoulder for leadership from someone else you we really have to start engaging and saying what can i do and i i, I believe the young generation, those who are under 30, you are so well positioned. During our time, we did not have this kind of possibility of, you know, dialoguing with, you know, very quickly using electronic media. The social medias are so available to you. It's a strength, a huge strength and opportunity. And this COVID has shown us just how crucial that information uh, technology can be. And yes, we are still battling with the COVID, but there are many things that, we, we, that it has made up know about the strengths we have. Not only just the capacity to organize meetings like this, but to develop very, very, very important agenda, such as the one we are discussing today. I never imagined a day I would go to a meeting on matters of diplomacy and i'm sitting with people who are medical people experts that i never associated with those kinds of things and and so on and so forth it is it is a good you know beginning to move in the right direction and i see in my view 
more opportunities than challenges. In fact, the challenges there, that are there can be converted into opportunities. I am seeing the possibility of great, greater global cooperation. When you see a prime minister get COVID-19, then you can see we are being leveled off. We are being reminded that this world does not have big and small when it comes to survival. Survival brings us all to the same level. And that rings a bell for the need to revisit the agenda of global cooperation, of multilateralism as opposed to bilateralism, as being your neighbor's keeper rather than you know, worrying about whether they are terrorists next door. And, and therefore, in doing that, you know, you know, I'm saying within the context of Africa especially, these very primitive nationalisms must go. And we take the agenda of regional integration much more seriously. We have all the institutions and legal framework in place. The only thing that needs uh, to be added in that mix is political will. That's it, walking the talk institutions, the legal and institution, everything is in place and excellent mechanisms are in place. And this is where we all must hold hands together and say, this is our world, this is our Africa, and there is nowhere somewhere we are going to go. And I think this COVID has taught us that. And it should have ignited in all of us this new energy. Intellectuals, the academy, like us, for a long time thought we are just theorists who produce knowledge of no use to anyone. It is becoming quite obvious, even government did that knowledge like yesterday. And that's why there is new, this new revival of supporting, you know, medics. And even for us at the University of Nairobi, there's a lot of the research department has become vibrant. And I think this is good for Africa because that has been our weak point to be able even to start innovating, develop our own technology you know, and, and stop depending on the outside world to help us even resolve issues of global diseases that come our way and we have no, we are clueless. We are found with, the, you know, uh, literally without a, a, a solution. And so I'm saying for me, I'm seeing positive things coming out of, uh, out of the, you know, the, the current situation. And yes, COVID is going to be that for a while, but the lessons learned, will help us deal with any future COVID in a much better way. And I'm also hopeful, even on matters of the economy, imagine how much money is being saved by people not going paperless. Papers are taking a lot of money. A lot of money being misused on the endless cars that should, be, should not even be on the road. Now we know we don't need those cars as much as we thought we did. And so a lot of new innovations are going to come up moving forward. Attitudes have to change and they will change because we are now seeing the world very, very differently uh, from before. So I really want to stop by saying that, you know, let's think more positive and rather than worrying about you know, all the challenges, especially the economy is worrying everyone. But there are also very many opportunities that this challenge has brought with it. And let's continue the conversation. So I thank the group for inviting me and I hope we continue with this uh, form of dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much to both our panelists, uh, our distinguished panelists, and thank you to all our viewers for watching. Thank you to our participants, um, our live participants. Also, special thanks to Uta Fitihat for making, uh, you know, for giving us this particular platform and for running the show and for making the arrangements to have this particular session. Special thanks as well to Dr. Gidui Moridi for directing the session. Uh, please remember to subscribe to Uta Fitihat. Like and share this video by clicking the relevant buttons below. We also invite you to watch and share our other videos. Share the knowledge. It's very dangerous to engage ignorance. Thank you very much. See you next time.